Normally, the main hangar deck of the Endurance was a loud and noisy place, filled with thunderhawks and stormbirds. The air was usually peppered with sounds of grinding, welding, the sounds of ammo crates being filled, carts full of all manners of machinery being rolled across the steel floors. But today, it was far different. Today, instead of the landing and attack craft that normally stood inside this hangar, there only stood members of the Death Guard, lined up shoulder to shoulder. All of them stood in perfect parade ground formation. Members of all seven great companies were in attendance, including the first captain, the commander, and the battle captain of the seventh company. The great company's banners hung limply in the still air of the hangar, even as the Stormbird approached. Unlike the uniform bone white of the Death Guard, this Stormbird held the same bone white coloring with an edging of blue. The mark of the World Eaters was emblazoned on its side. As Nathaniel Guerrero watched from his position with the Seventh Company, the Stormbird touched down, and his eyes cut towards Mortarion, who, in this rare moment, had a grin on his face. It was one of the few times he had actually seen Mortarion with anything other than a scowl. But then, considering who was on the Stormbird, Nathaniel Garrow could barely restrain a smile of his own. As the Stormbird settled upon the slate gray surface of the Endurance's hangar deck, the entirety of the Death Guard assembled snapped to attention. Soon, the only sound on the normally ear splitting hangar deck was the sound of the Stormbird's hydraulics slowly coming open. Nathaniel Garrow turned his eyes back in front of him even as he resisted the urge to stare into the darkness that was the Stormbird. But from inside came a voice, and at the sound of that voice, Garrow found his eyes drawn back to Mortarion's face, thankful for the helmet that he wore that kept the smile from showing on his features. Brother, what you've done annoys me. The voice seemed to roll from the inside of the Stormbird. Mortarion stepped closer to the World Eater ship even as a massive figure seemed to appear slowly out of the shadows. I believe that was the point. Mortarion planted the butt of his massive war scythe down next to his right foot with a loud thump. The interior of the Stormbird seemed to erupt with the massive Primarch Angron of the World Eater striding forward in three large steps to stand in front of Mortarion, four figures spilling out of the back of the Stormbird behind him, one small human, and three large Astartes, one of which carried a large axe. So sudden was the movement that the Daniel Gero almost took an involuntary step back, but the only thing Mortarion did was take a slow inhale from the chemical cocktail that seemed to pervade from around his gorget. Angron stepped past Mortarion, stalking his way down the line of the legionnaires that were assembled to greet him. Nathaniel Garrow glanced away from the towering Primarch of the World Eaters for just a moment to notice the way that the World Eaters themselves were arranged in front of the Death Guard. They stood at complete ease, gesturing towards the Death Guard legionnaires and making comments to each other. Nathaniel Garrow recognized instantly the figure of Karn, who seemed to be conversing with a small human with a red handprint across her chest. Angron turned and popped the collar of the fur cloak around his neck, before reaching up to scratch the back of his head as he came to stand in front of Mortarion once more. All of you find the urge to mock me and my legion. Once more, Nathaniel Gare was glad to be wearing a helmet, for his smile stretched from ear to ear upon hearing that. While some claimed that Lehman Russ was the Barbarian King, those that claimed that had never once met Angron or his legion. Nathaniel Garrow glanced over to realize that more World Eaters had simply walked down the ramp of the Stormbird, not even bothering to get any anything approximating a formation. Mostly they stood with their weapons slung on their shoulders, swords and axes. Compared to the ordered Legion of the Death Guard, the World Eaters seemed like nothing more or less than a gang. A condition which, even if they were aware of it, they simply did not seem to care about. Angron made a show of looking over the assembled Death Guard once more before looking back towards his legionnaires. Karn! Without an instant's hesitation, Karn snapped to attention and slammed his fist into his chest. I believe I should take it personally. Karn nodded his head once, slowly, gravely. Very personally, my Lord Primarch. Angron spun back to face Mortarion of the Death Guard and clasped his shoulders in his hands. Mortarion, my brother, it is good to see you. 
The smile on the Primarch's face was completely serene. A short time later, the door to Mortarion's personal quarter slid open, both Primarchs stepping inside. Mortarion went immediately for a large selection of bottles in the corner on a shelf. I hear you're fresh from compliance alongside Gilliman and Horus. Angron slowly eased himself into a chair. As he sat down, he pulled out a small data slate from behind his back that was tucked in behind his belt, hidden by the cloak. Yes, a gritter. Mortarion glanced back at his brother, even as he continued to mix the concoction that he was preparing for himself. I heard he was bloody. Believe me, it could have been much worse. They were prepared to defend it to the last. But they didn't? Mortarion turned, his drink prepared, and slowly began to sip a collection of toxins that would knock a space marine down flat. The Primarch of the Death Guard didn't even flinch at the toxicity of the brew that he had just concocted, and was drinking now for personal pleasure. No. Peace with honor. Horus was glad to end it diplomatically. Mortarion raised his eyebrow as he looked towards Angron. He had not expected that campaign to end with any sort of peace other than the peace that comes with the death of billions. But then again, that was before he knew that Angron had been deployed with his entire legion to the battlefield. I handled the negotiation. Mortarion only nodded at this. Gilliman was more of the idea we should have tried to take the Citadel by force. Mortarion grunted at this, and then simply waited for Angron to continue. If we had, they would have killed Throne knows how many of my sons. They had some rather clever defensive measures. Mortarion's lip quirked upwards in a smirk. I'm sure Rogel would have approved. No, this was more Perturabo's style. Mortarion's eyebrows furrowed at the thought of that. Slowly, Angron tapped the data slate that he had been holding for the past few seconds on his thigh before looking up at Mortarion. I noticed there are no remembrances on your ship. Don't tell me you've allowed those vermin aboard the Conqueror. At first, yes. But then they annoyed my captain. Mortarion raised an eyebrow. Which one? Draeger? Braun? Karn? Angron slowly grinned. Saren. Mortarion turned and put his cup on the table as he started laughing. <laughs> The stories I've heard about her true. All true, and probably understated. Of course, Mortarion already knew all the stories about Latara Sarn were true. She was quickly getting a reputation as the most outwardly brutal of any ship captain in the entirety of the Crusade's fleets. There's a reason I asked about the Remembrancers. Once more, Angron tapped the data slate on his thigh. I've been having communications issues. And patience issues. In truth, Mortarion did everything he could to keep his legion as distant from the Remembrancers as possible. He had no tolerance for the scribes and scriveners, the sculptors and the painters that would come with a Remembrancer order, and no matter how clear the orders came across his communications network, he would simply not have them around his legion. When Karn oversaw the removal of the Remembrancers, he started finding more and more of these. Angron offered the data slate over to Mortarion, and after a second, Mortarion took it from him. The data slate was nearly blank, except that in the top right-hand corner, there was a countdown going on. After a moment, Mortarion could see that within three weeks and two days, the timer would run out entirely. What's this? All of them share the same timer. Angron rose from his chair to stand beside Mortarion, both of them looking down at the data slate. All of them are so heavily encrypted that I can't even start to take it apart. Angron tapped on the surface of the data slate, and even as he did, Mortarion raised his eyes to meet Angron's. This was surprising to him. The World Eaters might have seemingly abandoned discipline, but this did not make them any less capable than any other Legion. Angron himself was one of the most clear-headed Primarchs that Mortarion knew. If he was having trouble with this, then there were only a few that might actually have a chance to unlock the Data Slate's secrets. What bothers me more is that once it was noticed and questions started getting asked, none of the humans knew where they had come from. Mortarion turned his attention back to the Data Slate. A few moments later, Angron answered Mortarion's unasked question. So far, 80. 
Almost six weeks worth of warp traveled away from where the Endurance currently was at in real space, another ship plowed through the warp. Coasting through the Immaterium, the Death Child was just merely another one of several capital ships that was currently transiting to another location to continue the Grey Crusade. Some members of the Sons of Horus polished their armor, others polished their martial skills, yet others just simply meditated for the task to come. Baron Teal fell into the middle of those categories, but for the moment at least, he was finished with his sparring for the day. He sat alone on the bench, doing his due diligence to make sure that the next brother that came to the sparring cages would not find it in disarray. As he polished his practice sword, he looked inside the cage nearest to him, watching two other legionnaires spar. He made note of the way they moved, the way they responded to each other's attacks and defenses and grinned to himself as he considered that one day he might be equal in rank to them, for they were both sergeants, and he was simply a line member, but not for much longer. He was going to prove himself. The two sergeants, Josiah and Baradon, were evenly matched as far as he could tell, but then he noticed something that he hadn't quite noticed before. A certain way that Baradon was moving, something that he couldn't quite put his finger on, he found it interesting. The movement was slight, but it was there. He couldn't quite put his finger on it, or where he had seen anyone else doing it before. As he finished polishing his sword, he rose, put on a robe, and walked out of the sparring den. He walked the near kilometer back to his quarters in near silence, only pausing to nod at a few of his battle brothers as they went by. As he reached his quarters, he went to his footlocker, opened it up, and withdrew his combat knife and for no reason that he could find that he understood, he slid it inside of a sheath that was hidden just inside the robe that he carried. Funny, he didn't remember having this sleeve before. He then sat cross-legged, looking down at the floor. He thought to meditate to pass the time in this warp transit, which was admittedly lasting longer than normal. But for some reason, he didn't close his eyes. He didn't slow his breathing. He simply waited. To him, nothing really seemed to miss. After a short amount of time, he stood up and walked back out of his quarters, heading back towards the sparring cages. Baron Teal nodded at each legionnaire who greeted him as he passed, saluting the officers that he came to. He wasn't really a talker, and everyone seemed to respect that. As he neared the sparring cages, he saw, but didn't really understand why, that he had timed his arrival back at the sparring cages right when Berbadon would be leaving. Baron Teal followed him. Baron Teal didn't know why he was following him at first, and he still didn't know why about five minutes later, as Berbadon kept on leading him further and further away from the rest of his brothers. Baron Teal noticed that the longer they walked, the more dim the lights were becoming, the closer to the outside of the hull of the ship they were getting. But for some reason, he didn't see anything wrong with this. He didn't even fully understand why he was following Berbadon. He was sure Berbadon knew that he was back there. But even still, he was taking special care to remain as noticeless as possible. Finally, as he rounded a corner, he saw Berbadon turned, facing him, standing underneath the lone light in a 50-foot stretch of hall. Baron Teal automatically took a look at the hallway. It was narrow, private, and isolated. The perfect place to take care of unwanted business. Barbadon stepped forward, placing himself in the shadows in the sole light of the entire hallway. As Baron Teal closed in on him, he couldn't help but notice that Berbadon was different. In fact, nothing about this marine reminded him of Berbadon at all. Once again, Baron Teal found it odd that this all made sense to him. Just out of arm's reach of Berbadon, Baron Teal stopped. Brother. Slowly, Barbadon shook his head, and Baron Teal canted his head to the side, wondering why he even expected that. I... Amalfarius. Whatever Barbadon, or whoever was posing as Barbadon, expected Baron Teal to do, he didn't know. Barbadon suddenly lunged, a flash of steel in his hand. Before Baron Teal even realized what was happening, his blade was out of his robe and plunged into Barbadon's chest. Barbadon's shocked expression was only heightened as he found that his own blade hand was held tightly in the hand of Baron Teal. 
Baron Teal's slice had been prepared, planned, and as Barbaron tried to jerk his knife hand back, he found that Baron Teal had it firmly in his grasp. Baron Teal leaned close to Barbaron, the one who identified himself as Alpharius. Barbaron's strength was failing fast, but it didn't stop him from trying at least one more time to dislodge the knife buried in his chest. Baron Teal didn't let him go, shoving him against the wall and taking the blade in a firm grip, dragging it upwards as he leaned close to Barbaron's ear. You have it all wrong, Baron Teal whispered. I am Alpharius, and you are not. Baron Teal yanked the blade out from Barbaron's chest, inverting his grip and slamming the blade up under Barbaron's chin, through his mouth and into his brain. Even as the light began to fail from Barbadon's eyes, Baron Teal was already speaking into a small transceiver on the hilt of his knife, relaying his position. Two days later, Baron Teal was back in the sparring cages, practicing against the servitor wielding two maces. Taking a brief respite from his training and mopping the sweat from his brow with a towel, he glanced over to the arming bench, where Barbadon sat, polishing an arming sword. Baron Teal smiled to himself. One day I'll be just like him, a sergeant, Baron Teal thought, and then continued with his training regimen.